All right, we're gonna get started. Thank you all for being here for this special event. Today's presentation is sponsored by the Multicultural Committee, and I'm Farah Habib. I'm a member of the committee and also a member of the English department here at BCC. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished guest, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, if you notice, or hopefully you all have, uh, the evaluation forms sometime during the presentation or at the end of it, if you could take a few minutes to fill out the form, we would appreciate your feedback. Also, um, the author, Iris Gomez, will be available after the uh, presentation for a book signing. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, uh, meet us outside uh, here in the lobby after this session. There's also another session at 11 o'clock, so if you're in a rush now, you can come back for 12.15. Um, the books are available for sale. Um, I also would like to go over the format. Uh, Ms. Gomez will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then after that, she will be answering your questions, because I know many of you have uh, read portions or all of the novel. So uh, to introduce our guest, by way of introducing her, I would like to uh, quote from the Massachusetts Bar Association, of which Ms. Gomez is a member. Ms. Gomez leads a double life, dedicated immigrant attorney by day, poet by night, so indeed. Um, a graduate of Boston University School of Law, she has taught an immigration law course there for many years, and uh, she continued to her education while uh, she was an attorney and uh, went on to earn her MFA in writing from Vermont College. Uh, her primary expertise is in immigration and refugee law, and she has, she has been working for the past uh, two decades uh, as a staff attorney and director of the Immigrate, Immigrate, Immigrant Protection Project at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute. From this advocacy position, she has won many legal victories for low-income immigrants and their families. Um, as for her literary background, uh, Ms. Gomez uh, first started writing poetry, and she has two uh, poetry anthologies to her name, one of which has won a national, uh, distinguished national award for her writing. Her debut novel, Try to Remember, which many of us are familiar with, um, is um, a book about her t uh, a teenage Colombian immigrant who to quote from Oprah's magazine, far from the stereotypical wisecracking rebel or clueless outsider, the narrator is an irresistible narrator, thank you, uh, observant, compassionate, and utterly genuine, trying to balance family loyalty and a yearning to discover who did I dare to be. Ms. Gomez speaks from her own personal experience in this book. She came uh, to the United States with her family when she was only five years old. She's originally from Colombia. And she, as a child, she spent her um, years in New York and Miami. And she now lives with her family in the Boston area. So welcome to BCC, Iris. Thank you everyone for coming and for um, um, being such a supportive uh, community and um, being interested in immigrant literature. So um, what I would like to do is um, talk to you a little bit about some themes that I uh, was working with in my book that I think really um, show up in a lot of immigrant narratives, and we can talk about that during the Q&A as well, but um, that were also um, important in my book and were important in my life, uh, both my personal life and my professional life. And um, so those, those three themes are, first, the theme of allegiance to the culture of the immigrant's home country. The second is the theme of uh, inclusion or exclusion by the larger society in the new country uh, of home. And the third is the theme of resilience 
uh, that is how, uh, how immigrants overcome the adversities and bounce back after challenge after challenge after challenge. Um, so um, these, these themes occurred in, in my own life, emerged in my own life, both uh, as I was growing up. Uh, I, I did not have an easy childhood myself, and I uh, was the first member of my family to go to college, and uh, uh, certainly uh, had an opportunity to uh, uh, learn about the immigrant experience shared by many, perhaps of you, but many of the clients I later came to work with. Um, so uh, also in my work, which has been with low-income immigrants, I've also had an opportunity to observe their, uh, their joys, their victories, and their struggles. So uh, I try to draw on both of those uh, areas, my personal and my professional life, in, in writing the book. But um, before talking about those themes in terms of the book and my experiences, I wanted to read you a poem because it is National Poetry Month, April is National Poetry Month, and I think um, I have a poem that opens up this question of um, how do immigrants belong in a new society uh, pretty well. So um, it's, it's short. <laughs> And it's called, fittingly, A Map of the World. And this is from my book, When Comets Rained, which I also have some copies of if anyone is interested in buying that one. Two yellow booklets, the black letter law of my mother's childhood taught me history, geography, the story of the chipchas who hammered gold into bracelets, masks, odd shapes like land masses floating on earth. My first year in this country, I floated among words, pairing Spanish with English to anchor the numbered continents with names. Africa, equidistant from either home, a memory of two-legged strangers whose children painted dark caves. Oceania, dragging Australia and a fleet of prefixes and suffixes across the sea. Asia, Antarctica, twin vastnesses, human and not. Europe, a fairy tale of bickering kings and queens, sparks of Germanic and Latin languages like tips of swords that sliced America in half. When I discovered America was two continents at school, one at home, I felt like Noah packing the ark with all things strange and wonderful, old and new, not knowing what the watery world might become, whose map would help me find where everything belonged. So I, I, I chose that poem because as you can see, the child in the poem, you know, it's a, a person, it's autobiographical, but um, you, you fictionalize. Uh, but the child in the poem discovers that there are two ways of answering a very simple question. How many continents are there? A simple question about geography. Um, the way it's taught in her country, which is five continents, and the way it was taught here, seven continents. Uh, how many people have been taught five continents in another country. Maybe everybody is from here, but uh, anyway, um, this discovery plunges her into a much deeper cross-cultural sea in which she, like all of us, has to uh, map her own way through competing truths about the world. Um, and so they raise the question, what is truth um, in in uh, a cross-cultural uh, context. And so that is at the core of uh, some of the issues I was grappling with in, in this novel, um, Try to Remember. So um, I know that some of you have probably read it. Have some people read the book already? 
All right, so I won't, um, I won't give away too much, but I have to give you a little bit of background to illustrate how these three themes that I mentioned um, play out in the book. Uh, so Gabby is a teenager, a Colombian girl, and the protagonist of the novel. And she moves to Miami with her parents and her siblings with lots of hopes and expectations that working class people and they finally have brought, bought their own home. So American dream, right? Uh, but then something happens that causes the father, Poppy, the breadwinner, to lose his job and um, subsequently to be incapable of holding on to any job for any length of time. And his behavior starts to become erratic, unpredictable, angry, etc. And Gabby um, is um, soon pu pulled into the role of being his helper and assistant as the family sinks deeper and deeper into economic and um, emotional distress. So instead of seeking outside help, the family turns inward and they um, decide to keep this obviously growing mental illness a secret from the outside world. And this is both out of shame, but also out of a belief in keeping things private within the family that is very um, deeply ingrained. And so um, Gabby, who is the eldest daughter, who speaks English, who uh, understands the American system outside the family, uh, that is so bewildering to the parents and the aunts and uncles, et cetera, um, becomes the, um, the cultural ambassador of the family in this, um, in this situation where they are somewhat isolated and then there are all these things going on. Um, and she's trying to keep the father from uh, getting himself into trouble outside of the home. So how, how does this first theme of loyalty to the culture of the home country emerge? Well, here, to begin with, Gabby is assigned all kinds of very burdensome and some would say abusive duties in, in keeping her father calm. Uh, among them are typing, retyping entire encyclopedia <laughs> sections and uh, letters that become increasingly delusional for the father. And um, these are tasks that cause her to sacrifice the life of a normal teenager for one who is, in some respects, a, a slave to the needs of her family. Now, why does she do this? Um, in part, in part, it is out of loyalty. Um, a strong ethic of loyalty to the family, come what may, drives Gabby to um, uh, go along with things that certainly my teenage kids would never, <laughs> never have done, um, and certainly her peers would probably not understand. Um, but it's a fidelity to this ethic that um, the family um, is what matters and adhering to their wishes and their needs is, is the number one priority. So she's learned that and she um, is trying to uh, act it out. Even as she's uh, growing up and she learns that she is a smart girl and is offered opportunities that would take her um, into uh, I independent areas outside of the family. And she um, encounters difficulty with accepting these opportunities and is constrained to accept them because, um, as well, her family has very traditional expectations for what uh, women are permitted to do. Um, and in the context of uh, a girl growing up uh, in that time, she is expected to, uh, even as she performs well, she's 
it's in no one's horizon that she would go live somewhere else outside the family, even for college. So um, I was interested in this um, in this theme because uh, on the one hand, I uh, myself uh, I'm a I'm a big believer in the power and the beauty of um, the Latino family and its and its strong um, ethics. On the other hand. I wanted to also explore what happens when uh, that loyalty goes too far, uh, which it does in the book as the, the very serious problems that the father has become too difficult to navigate, um, really too much for a girl, too much for a family, and the outside world, including the world of the law, come crashing in. So that brings us to the second theme I wanted to talk about, which is the issue of inclusion or exclusion of immigrants in the larger society. So we all know that discriminatory um, actions or activities are um, reflected in social interactions very widely throughout society. But one of the deeper ways in which social exclusion is manifested is structurally, uh, including through our laws. And um, in the context of immigrants, uh, some of the ways that the, the laws have marginalized or turned immigrants into outsiders is through the enactment of certain kinds of laws that inevitably make um, immigrants feel uh, different from everyone else. And I would say there are, in my experience, um, there are two kinds of immigration laws that have done this. Um, the first set of uh, social exclusion laws have to do with access to public and private um, uh, services and benefits that, as a society, we create for the greater good. Since the 70s until uh, uh, the 90s in particular, the, these sorts of laws have become increasingly harsh toward immigrants. Initially, they started with uh, uh, e excluding the undocumented. Um, and, and by these benefits, I should clarify, I mean things like uh, health care programs, safety net programs, higher education, access, tuition, driver's licenses, um, access to certain occupations, et cetera. So uh, a wide range of activities that we all um, are expected to have some access to, and yet for immigrants, these rules are set up that um, restrict their ability to access these, these rights and benefits. So um, in um, 1996, these, um, the, the dramatic increase in these kinds of laws was manifested in perhaps the most glaring example, uh, the welfare reform law that kicked elderly and disabled permanent residents of this country, green card holders, off of their life-sustaining SSI disability checks. So you see it wasn't just undocumented people, but uh, people who are legally entitled to live here who were suddenly denied the same access as other elderly and sick people um, who are members of the society. That's an example of the kinds of social exclusion laws that, um, that uh, exclude immigrants. A second type of social exclusion policy that comes up in the book um, more um, apparently has to do with what um, Professor Kenstrom at Boston College Law School calls social control laws. And these are laws that impose an extra penalty on immigrants um, for uh, conduct uh, besides the ordinary civil and criminal consequences. And that penalty is deportation. So for example, um, if uh, a, a person commits a criminal offense, um, regardless of whether they are an immigrant, a citizen, legal or not, um, 
they uh, go through the criminal justice system, they have to pay the price, right? In addition, immigrants, even legal immigrants, are at risk of deportation because of the growth of these social control immigration laws that impose deportation for even, um, some would say, relatively minor offenses. And this is, this is the theme I wanted to, I, I tried to explore in the book. Um, in um, Gabby's case, her father, as he becomes uh, increasingly ill and is not being treated, um, of course, they're keeping this a secret, and um, he's not getting any kind of uh, counseling, medication, nothing. He's, uh, he's getting increasingly unwell. And um, this brings him into, inevitably, into conflict with other people. And there's an incident at one of his jobs where he um, uh, blows up and then is charged with assault. And the kind of assault that he's charged with constitutes in immigration law a crime of moral turpitude for which he could lose his green card and be deported. And so this issue of how the law imposes this extra very frightening penalty on this family um, illustrates the scope of the, um, uh, these social exclusion laws and policies. On the other hand, Gabby has um, a quasi-boyfriend, uh, North American, who um, has been uh, busted for a marijuana possession offense. And he gets probation and pays a fine, but it goes away. And um, a crime that if her father were convicted of, he would lose his green card for. So, um, so she begins to see these disparities in treatment and this causes her to um, ask whether, even though she's been permitted to live here permanently, she's really allowed to belong. Um, and that, that is the question for uh, the greater um, community, is how do we make immigrants feel that they belong um, if we have different standards um, for them? So um, it, it's an issue that has um, troubled me in my work um, with immigrants. I've seen many families broken up, um, legal families, um, and many hearts broken because of these kinds of policies. So um, I wanted to then turn to my um, third theme, which is this, um, this theme of resilience. So, how do people bounce back? Why do some people bounce back from adversities and others go down a bad path? <laughs> and um, in, in um, uh, try to remember, Gabby is confronted with many classical forms of adversity that uh, other uh, uh, heroes and heroines of immigrant literature encounter. There's poverty, right? They're struggling with uh, economic issues the difficulties of reconciling the old and the new culture, um, the struggle to belong to a society that throws roadblocks in the way of immigrants feeling like they can belong. But in addition to all of these um, classical forms of adversity, Gabby's confronting um, a unique personal adversity, and that is the experience of losing the father she knew um, into uh, uh, what she calls a Mr. Hyde character she can no longer recognize. So uh, the pain of um, her father disappearing on her. And um, any ordinary adolescent girl facing that and, and the, the other challenges could easily end up on one of the many tragic paths we know, we know well, but Gabby overcomes. Um, and I won't tell you the ending for those of you who are um, uh, going to be reading the book, but um, I do want to share a few thoughts about how she um, uh, overcomes these um, adversities. And um, I, 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 I think that these are not just um, 
unique to Gabby, but they are um, qualities and um, skills and uh, characteristics that I have seen over the years in my work with immigrants from many different backgrounds and situations. And um, so I wanted to impart them to you, although you know we can talk during the Q&A about your, your thoughts about this. But um, I think the reason that she and, and others um, develop resi resi um, uh, overcome adversity is that they develop this, this quality of resilience to, to be able to bounce back after multiple challenges and come back into the ring, so to speak. So there, there are three elements, I think, in, in, in Gabby's case um, that can be extended to others. The first is a strong sense of family or community. So although Gabby clearly struggles with her family um, and the expectations they have of her, the values of interdependent problem solving that she learns there give her the first ingredient in becoming a survivor instead of um, a failure. And that is faith in some kind of community. The second is mentors. Within her community and in her outside school world, both adults and peers let Gabby know that they believe in her and they offer positive alternatives for the future that um, uh, outweigh the fatalism that she sometimes feels in the dark um, moments of uh, crisis. So that's the second ingredient is a faith in the future. Thirdly, awareness of one's inner resources. Gabby's a smart girl, she's achieving well in school, but she's haunted by the understandable fear that she will develop her father's illness. Very common for uh, people, uh, children of people with mental illness to think they're going to inherit it, um, and in Gabby's case, it goes as far as to feel like maybe her mind is, is, um, is a danger to weakness. And there's episodes in the book where she's trying to stop herself from thinking, from thinking too much, from thinking too often, um, as if her mind were her enemy. But her experiences show her that ultimately her mind, the very thing she fears, is the source of her strength, and that um, there lies the power for her to shape her own life. So that's the third ingredient that all of us need to develop resilience, which is faith in ourselves. So um, these themes of identity, belonging, and resilience are, um, I'm sure, themes that are familiar to, to all of you, they, they make up our lives, but I think they, t they play a especially poignant role in immigrant literature, and um, that was why I wanted to focus on them today. So um, I thought what I would do now, um, before we have a, a question and answer dialogue, is read you a short section from the book um, that is not, um, it's not one of the heavier, scary <laughs> scenes, but um, one of the lighter ones. But it does show a little bit of the interplay between, um, you know, the, the, the cultures, at least in Miami, in this era, okay? You guys are, most, most of you are much younger, but um, there was a time where, um, you know, Jim was, a, 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 a somewhat novel <laughs> activity in school. So um, Gabby has just moved to Florida and she's going to uh, public school. So I'm going to read you a little section from the scene wh where her, excuse me, where she has to show up in gym class and her, her parents have gotten her a note from a questionable doctor um, to excuse her from gym. Um, because of the father's very strong moral views. Um, so, uh, so I'll read you this. I boarded my bus to Flagler Junior High, a pastel complex of one-story buildings 
that had been augmented with a cluster of aquamarine trailers to accommodate the growing number of Cuban refugees rescued by the Americans. No one had saved me, a Colombian immigrant, but I fit right in among them with my homemade wardrobe and old-fashioned parents. Nationality mattered less than the fact that we all ate arroz, rice, every day and spoke Spanish. Since I'd moved here so late in the school year, I didn't know many people and was eager to pal up with my new friend, Lydia. Together, we headed to gym. Lydia didn't have a doctor's note to excuse her from undressing among strangers, and soon I wished I didn't either. The teacher frowned at Dr. Sanabria's permission slip. She tapped her amazingly white sneaker against a stool and announced, I'm taking this to the principal. Then she pushed a lock and a gym suit at me. Go change. What could be wrong with my doctor's note, I worried as I turned to nervously follow the other girls. If only phys ed could be an elective, like Spanish, I wish forlornly, imagining my father's apoplectic face when he found out that the school had made us undress. Even my mother had reacted badly when I first brought home the gym suit payment request. Why aren't your own clothes allowed, she demanded, examining the notice suspiciously. The nuns never made you change your clothing. We're supposed to exercise on a field, and you sweat a lot, I tried to explain patiently. They want us to shower so we won't smell. Shower, Mommy exclaimed. Yes, they have a room with showers, and then when you come out, the teacher hands you a clean towel. You're naked? She'd asked, incredulous. That had prompted her to spring into action. She got on the phone with her relatives until she found out about the mysterious Dr. Sanabria, who'd supplied my gym note. She'd acted as if her own morals were at stake, but I knew they were wrapped up with those of the Latin American dictator in charge of our feminine virtue, my father. Now, as other girls began changing in the locker room, I tried to figure out how to undress as modestly as possible in that very public arena. The truth was, I wasn't looking forward to disrobing and parading around in the nude myself. Hesitantly, I unfolded my gym suit and slowly began putting it on under my jumper. Then I rapidly slipped the jumper off over my head while sliding the gym suit up to cover my bra at the same time. Out of breath by then, I jerked my arms into the suit and quickly snapped it shut over my chest. When I darted anxious glances around, no one seemed to be watching me. The other girls were too preoccupied with how bad their own suits looked on them to judge me. I studied myself in the mirror. The gym suit was made out of a white canvas material you couldn't see through. The top half was okay but the bottom resembled a diaper that bunched up over your rear. This totally accentuated the thighs, and mine suddenly felt more naked than they ever had before. Alina, a friend of Lydia's who'd been assigned a locker next to mine, complained bitterly. At least you have long legs, she pointed out. Look at these fat drumsticks. I shook my head in empathy as we headed outside. Since I hadn't brought in sneakers, I was forced to wear my flats, making my long, exposed legs stand out even more. How immoral I felt just wearing that outfit. Soon, however, our activities made me forget about appearances and morality. First, we were ordered to jog around the field. It was toasty out, not a lick of dew left in the grass. I teamed up with Lydia and Alina, the slow bunch. Other girls whizzed by making fun of us, and Alina whistled back in defiance. By the time we reached Miss Michaels and her stopwatch, my feet ached from running in flats, and I was completely drenched in sweat. Alina gave me a high five for being the last one in with her. At least I was making friends. Miss Michaels glared. Ladies, she said coldly, we need to work toward an 11-minute mile. Then she shooed us over to the other side of the field where a plucky girl was supervising others on various exercise contraptions. The most intimidating of these was the horse. 
a wooden podium topped with a vinyl pad that we were expected to run toward and then leap over, splitting our legs apart to land harmlessly and gracefully on our feet. In Alina's group, shrieks of joy rang out when somebody actually made it across safely. Miss Michaels ordered those who completed a successful jump over to the tennis nets, then stood before the rest of us with her arms crossed. This is not a joke. I expect each of you to perform this jump. Do you understand me? Doubtful nods followed. Lydia strolled diffidently to the front and managed to get across with a slight push from the spotter. Her fans applauded and cheered. Next, there were two failed attempts by a big girl, Margarita Dominguez, and her friend, Carmen. No one laughed this time. Miss Michaels wiped her forehead with a towel. By the time my turn came, I had a terrible case of jitters. Plus, the podium was like distant Bluto. How would I ever reach it? You don't have to start so far back, Miss Michaels yelled to me but I didn't trust her. I backed up a few more steps, closed my eyes, willed the nervousness out of me, and ran as fast as humanly possible. At some point, I heard Miss Michaels yell, jump, and leapt at her command, succeeding in grabbing the vinyl covering before my shoulders inexplicably hit wood. I'd entirely forgotten to shoot out my legs and somersaulted over, landing on the damp grass beyond the podium flat on my back, I thought of my family, my mother, aunts, uncles, and especially my Jehovah-like father, hovering above my hospital bed while I lay comatose and awaiting final judgment in that awful, skimpy, white gym suit. So I think it's time. <laughs> It's another, another time, gym suit time. <laughs> but uh, it, it's important for you to learn your history. Uh, so um, questions. I'm happy to answer questions about the book, about myself, um, immigration law, whatever um, you'd like to ask me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right now, and I want to know what advice you would give them about how do they balance trying to learn English, which they need to learn to access opportunities here, but at the same time keep this sense of family and culture, which would also mean keeping their first language. That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I'm an expert in balancing because to me, even today, I, my life is a constant struggle to balance my kids, my work, my right, you know. So um, I really have a lot of um, admiration for newcomers who are trying in a very difficult economy to make a living for themselves and their families, usually at wages that are not very good, and, um, you know, to be true to themselves. So, uh, but as far as uh, the youth um, who are trying to learn English and the, um, who have uh, parents, um, uh, I do think that um, giving the parents some opportunity, not only to learn English, but um, to acquire literacy is, um, is a wonderful thing because um, it's very liberating. I've had clients where, um, their um, ki the kids were able to um, teach parents who had been illiterate to read and write, and um, it was such an empowering experience. So sharing some of the learning options with the members of your family so that you're not the only one, um, I think is, is a, um, something I have found helpful. Um, unfortunately, I know there's a terrible um, waiting list problem with many English classes and people struggle to get in and, and it's certainly hard if in terms of the adults to actually learn the language as an adult. Uh, English is not an easy language 
Um, but I think persevering is, um, is, is something else that I've learned from uh, the clients who've succeeded. I, you know, I, I actually became a citizen late in life, and I, um, I took my citizenship exam um, at the American Red Cross with people who were, would probably be my clients <laughs> if I hadn't been sitting there. And I remember um, talking to one young man who took the um, test and um, had joked about how many times he had taken it, but finally he passed and he got his citizenship. So, you know, hard work and perseverance, the same thing, you know, um, we all hear about in school, whatever stage of life we're at, I think is important. The role? Yeah, I uh, should, do you feel it's important to people to teach their own language or is it something else? Oh, uh, yes, I just went um, to a wonderful talk. I work with the Haitian community. I have a lot of Haitian immigrant clients. Um, and um, uh, I attended a wonderful uh, reception for a book that just was published by the president of Mass Bay, uh, Dr. Joseph. She's a Haitian American um, who wrote a book about um, the Haitian Creole language. And it's a beautiful book. Maybe you guys could get it for the library here. Uh, but she talked about um, something that was very inspiring to me. And she said that language isn't just words it carries the culture. And um, so she um, said it's very important for um, young Haitian kids to continue to um, develop their skills in their home country language, even when they're um, learning English, because you know pretty much you need to have English to um, uh, excel at any uh, reasonably paying job in this society. So. Um, uh, so I guess I agree with her. I think it's important to carry, carry on, um, understanding that you know there are limits to how much access um, young people have in um, schools to um, to language uh, classes. You know, when when I I live in Milton, when my daughter entered our public elementary school, there was no Spanish available. So. Uh, but there was a French immersion program, <laughs> so I put her in there, and now she's in college in Canada, in Quebec, and speaks fluent French, <laughs> so, and Spanish with a French accent, so uh, it's, it's interesting. Yes? That's a good question. Some people say that every book, um, I've heard f fiction writers say this, every book is based on you. You know, like, in, it's like a dream. If you have a dream, you're the one dreaming. So even if you're dreaming about a cannibal, there's something about you and that cannibal. So, um, but um, that said, in terms of the facts, I was very fortunate never to have had immigration problems or trouble with the law <laughs> with my family um, in that in the way that Gabby's father does um, and the being faced with the lo threatened loss of their green cards so um, in that respect I really drew on my experience with representing people who faced losing their green cards in sometimes unjust circumstances um, in terms of the um, the the true to life facts, um, I did grow up with mental illness in my family, and it was very important to me to um, write about it and bring it into the open because um, we still have um, in the Latino community uh, under treatment of mental illness, um, and. Uh, for many complex reasons, but when my book came out, just to give you an example, um, the National Association on Mental Illness contacted me to see if I would be a spokesperson for their outreach to the Latino community because they feel so strongly that um, people are, are not sufficiently screened or treated or 
don't access the resources that they need. So, um, and of course, I did grow up in Florida, um, and um, I um, wanted to also tell the story about Miami. How many of you have been to Miami? Okay, so now you go to Miami, and it's this, you know, international, cosmopolitan, really fancy place. But when I was growing up in Miami, it was a little dinky town. We, had, you know, no sidewalks on the street. It was all dirt. You know, all these canals, um, and so uh, it really grew up. And I wanted people to see the story of Miami, which is embedded in the. Um, the background of what's happening in the book. So that, that part is true as well. And I did a little bit of research as well. Yes? Yes. Right, right. Well, thanks. That's a great question. And um, certainly, as a parent, I can say it's, uh, among all of my adversities, has been the most <laughs> challenging <laughs> parenting teenagers. So um, I think it's, you know, th there's, there's a lot, a lot on teenagers' plates in this country right now. So um, I, I understand that they are struggling. But um, one thing that I think has been very important um, in my experience, is having peers who share it, um, who share the, some cultural um, affinity, and or even language affinity. Uh, for example, in the case of my daughter, I think if I had just made her learn French by herself, she would not have done that. But in school, they were like the French kids. Now, the French kids were a North American, African American, Haitian, Gabriela Colombia, you know, they were from everything, but they called themselves the French kids because they had an affinity group around this other language. And similarly, um, I've worked with, um, uh, I serve on the board of a foundation, the Himes Foundation, that bonds programs uh, for at risk teens. And some of the very successful ones, for example, in Chelsea, have um, peer group opportunities for the youth to work together, you know, to fight for their own rights. Um, and sometimes it's hard as a parent to, you know, let them go and do that. <laughs> Trust they're gonna end up okay, but, but I think connecting them with community organizations that have a good track record of doing um, that kind of programming for teens um, is, is a good opportunity. Yes. I have a literature question. Yes. Um, I see that you write both poetry yeah. and, um, and fiction. Could you talk about what uh, draws you to both different types of genres? Sure. Um, so um, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, one time I went to, um, as a young lawyer, I went to a time management seminar. <laughs> And the woman who gave this man time management seminar um, had everyone write down on, ca on a card some of the things, one word things that um, motivate them. Because I guess under this theory, you're supposed to figure out what are your life goals, then what are your um, yearly goals, then what are your um, monthly goals, and how do you plan your week? So it's, it was this process of that began with the big picture. So one of my cards, she comes over to look at, at um, my cards, and one of my cards said, beauty. And she looked at me, and she said, and you're a lawyer? And she looked so sad. <laughs> but then I had to explain, I'm also a poet. So um, you know, the quest to recreate the beauty that I experience in the world is part of my reason for wanting to write poetry. And I still do write some poems um, when I can. Um, I think the impulse to write fiction 
came, you know, from the desire to tell a story. You know, we all have stories to tell, not just about ourselves, but about um, the things we experience in the world, our adventures, our struggles. Everybody has a story. And so, um, so I think that that came from that um, uh, motivation to want to tell some of these stories, the story of what does it mean to love in a Latino family? Um, what, what is um, the experience of the immigrant against these um, difficult laws? Um, and um, what's, what, what is the story of Miami? Where did it come from? So the, the, the desire to want to just tell some stories um, motivated that. Yes? I have a legal question. Ooh. Oh, yes. Oh, many questions. <laughs> so um, to begin with, I, I didn't start out wanting to be an immigration lawyer. Um, I started out actually wanting to be a writer, a journalist. Um, and then in college, I, um, I took a, a turn. And many people do. I'm sure people here are changing majors. Um, and um, I decided I wanted to work with low-income people in some way like my family. And I wasn't really sure what the route was. But in college, I had some mentors that exposed me to the idea that you could actually be a lawyer and help people. And um, they were some of them were lawyers, and some of them had been represented by lawyers. Um, and so um, I ended up in legal services. Um, and I, I had mentors. I was lucky to have people who brought me into legal service and said, this is the kind of organization that you should work in, even if you have to collect food stamps because the wages are so bad or <laughs> whatever. So I ended up in um, legal services and eventually specializing in immigration law uh, because it was a very interesting area to me because it, it raised all these social policy questions that we were just talking about. Um, and also, you know, people in the community had a deep need, so I, I was responding to that. Um, as far as um, where immigration law is right now, uh, boy, it's a big question. Um, it's lamentable that we haven't been able to pass comprehensive immigration reform legislation which would allow people who have been working here steadily for many years to get their green cards and kind of plan for their futures, um, or even something that people may have heard about, the DREAM Act, which would at least allow young people who um, emigrated to the U.S. as kids and have you know, graduated high school, maybe there are some of you here, um, to get their um, legal status. So uh, I continue to hope, but I think it's very difficult. You know, obviously, there are big problems in Congress right now. Just passing a budget <laughs> for the government um, is, is really fraught with controversy. So um, maybe not right now, but, but I do think that there is um, there is a need for change, and eventually that need will drive change. Um, and as far as, I don't know if you were asking about careers in immigration, maybe for, for students. So, um, you know, there's always a need. Um, in, in difficult times, uh, there are, there's less work, for sure, just like in every other field, lawyers were affected by the economic downturn, and you know, even in the private sector, um, I know that uh, lawyers have had trouble um, keeping up since uh, since everything started going downhill. Um, but there are also other uh, careers besides lawyers in the immigration field. There are um, opportunities to work. Um, um, as paralegals as well, you know, uh, essentially helping people with applications is another uh, helpful thing. And um, in the social services, humanities, you know, uh, mental health, 
people with experience as an immigrant and experience working with immigrants who speak other languages. I know there's a, a great need for um, mental health and, and other social services um, uh, professionals who can work with um, a very diverse immigrant population in the state. So I think there are, there are lots of opportunities if, if, um, if you're interested in working with immigrants in some way. Yes. Um, I'm not going to say what it was because I'm not going to give you the book, but um, is there a reason why you picked the specific mental illness you picked rather than other mental illnesses um, for the father? Well, um, you, you don't know throughout most of the book, you don't really know what the illness is. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, uh, again, without saying what it is, at the time, this is, you know, uh, over 40 years ago, what we knew, knew about mental illness was really very limited. And um, what we knew about the brain, I mean, it's only been in the last maybe 15 years that we've learned how the brain works. And so um, it, it, it's really, um, opened up the doors to treatment for many of these illnesses. But uh, one of the reasons I thought that that was a good um, example is that um, it wasn't treatable at the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I teach here. My name's Meredith Platt, and I brought my English class. Yay! <laughs> Meredith's class. <laughs> Well, um, certainly the um, opportunity is there. I, I think for young women here who want to be lawyers, there, there is an opportunity. You know, just yesterday, I think uh, Governor Patrick um, named the first openly gay wo woman to the Supreme Judicial Court. Before that, he named um, uh, 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 Judge Duffley uh, the, the first Asian American woman to the bench. So certainly the opportunities are there. Um, personally, um, sure. Um, I, I have had um, some encounters that were n not uh, fair that I don't think would have um, occurred to a man. Uh, they, I wouldn't have been treating that that way if I was a man. Um, as a Latina, I've also had um, experiences um, uh, being fully accepted as a peer. Um, but um, I do think that um, the legal system itself wants to repair itself. And uh, so I do, I do encourage young women to be activists within whatever area they are, um, they choose to pursue. Uh, because, you know, the more we open up rights for everyone, um, the more inclusive it can be, you know, even for groups that, you know, didn't exist before. You know, I, I was having a conversation with um, some of my daughter's friends and they were using words, I didn't even know what they were, they were, G L B T F or you know, I didn't I didn't even know is that gay lesbian you know trans what do they all mean <laughs> you know but you know opening pathways for all these groups it is important because it makes it makes um, opportunity truly democratic if everybody has a crack. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Can you give me an example of what was really what encouraged you to do that? 
What, what encouraged me to do that? Yeah. Oh, well, um, you know, my own family struggles, not necessarily with Im immigration, but my own family had a lot of legal problems of not uh, criminal nature, but, you know, just um, managing. <laughs> managing um, their their uh, difficult lives. And so I was always turned to, even um, a as a, in college, you know, everybody in the family would be calling me. Uh oh, I have this problem. Can you help me with this? Can you solve this? Can you solve that? So I sort of became a problem solver like, um, like Gabby. And, um, you know, that kind of skill ended up being useful in, um, in being a lawyer. Um, it's not all about just reading law books. It's about solving people's problems. Um, but, but more importantly, when I was in law school, um, I volunteered or I, I, I took a, uh, an internship in a community legal services office in Boston South End. And I was very fortunate that one of the attorneys there was a Puerto Rican lawyer. Um, who had very strong commitment to legal services. And he, sat me down and he said, you know, if you want to do good for your people, this is a good career for you, you know. So go into this nonprofit, um, even though it's not remunerative, it maybe it might not help your family financially. They're all kind of wondering, I thought she's a lawyer, how come <laughs> she's not sending us very much money? <laughs> you know, so there was that um, discrepancy. They all thought I was going to suddenly you know, buy everyone's houses and all of that, but you know, I really wasn't able to make that much money in legal services, but, but he really persuaded me that I could do more for the overall community uh, by, by, by working in legal services, and, and I think he was right, and I feel very indebted to him for that lesson. Yeah, wait, wait there's somebody in the back who hasn't had a question, yeah. Oh, good, good. Well, um, it lets me talk about my daughter, who I adore. Um, I started writing my novel when my daughter was the age of the, the girl in the book. And so I was um, having a lot of opportunity to engage with her about, well, what is it like to come of age, to become a teenager, to become a woman? Um, and so we spent a lot of time dealing with issues around that and mother-daughter stuff. So it just got me thinking that now was the time to write about this, this question um, of what it means to love. Um, you know, how far does your family loyalty go? How far, how, how do you break away without not loving your family? So, um, uh, so I think that was, that was a motivator. And one of the ways in which it's different from my life is that when I was creating the character of Gabby, you know, you, you, you take details from different people and you, you know, and you imagine and you create someone else. So I like to think of Gabby, the character in my book, as having some of my qualities um, that I had as a girl, uh, like being a problem solver. Um, uh, being very um, intellectually oriented, but but I was I was an innocent girl. Um, my daughter is a lot more savvy, sharp. You know, she's got um, you know her, her wits about her. I think you have to be today. Teenagers today have to be a lot more savvy about the world. And so I took those qualities that I admire in her, and I put them in Gabby. So she's sort of a composite of, you know, aspects of me, aspects of my daughter, and then sort of this imagined girl who grows up because of the things that happened to her. Yeah. Do you think you'll write another novel, um, like a sequel? To let us know what's going on again. Well, that's what got my my daughter says. You have to do. Gabby goes to college, mom. <laughs> so. Um, 
Perhaps, but I'm actually working now on a, a different kind of book, um, uh, which um, is about um, a young woman in her 20s who, um, sort of a love story, she, she's um, uh, multicultural. She's um, Latina from different countries. And so um, she falls in love with this guy and follows him to Puerto Rico. And then he, um, a tragedy befalls her, and that's the end of her love. So then now she feels displaced in love and displaced in, in country. And so she goes on a journey um, around uh, with these women who are researchers from Harvard who are studying the journey of the Spanish ships through the Caribbean. And so what I'm trying to write about is what does it mean to be a multicultural person. You know, what is your history if it comes from all these places? Because I've gone around and I've um, talked, not just to, you know, people like you, but I, I did this great class with these fourth graders on poetry. They, they were doing I Am From poems, where they had to write poems about the heritage. And then, so they, almost everybody had a heritage of four or five different places, you know, so I am from, the Chinese dragon and uh, Norwegian fish, and you know they were like, <laughs> I, I was like so bowled away by how complex cultural identity has become, and so um, so that's part of what I want to explore. Is what does it mean? Yes. Well, it took about three years to write it. You know, remember, I'm, you know, working. <laughs> um, and I did have my kids, uh, so, and I had to go to the gym, et cetera. So, uh, you know, so it took that long. And then um, it was another two years to get it published because first you have to get an agent to get a novel published. Pretty much you, you need an agent, which is a kind of competitive process in itself. So once I had the agent, then the agent sends it around to publishers, and um, and they, um, you know, hopefully eventually find a publisher. So yeah, so it's quite a process. Yes. Hi, my name is Ronnie Oliver. I'm from Dominican. Yay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I don't know about yours, <laughs> but um, I do think that um, it, it's an opportunity, um, and I, it's great that you are taking the opportunity to learn it, and you're, you're speaking very well, so um, I you know, I, I, I acknowledge you for, you know, for doing that. Um, I, I think it's very hard for people to um, uh, succeed um, economically without English. Um, you know, I have family back in Miami that, you know, still don't speak English, you know. And, you know, they work at Pizza Hut, washing dishes, and, you know, I mean, they're, they have really limited options. They haven't really been able to branch out. So I think it's it's critical, but it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice your other learning. I think your other learning is also important. 